This is how the U.S. military intends to survive a nuclear war. And it's not what you think. Based on the iconic Boeing 747, this plane is basically a turbocharged airliner. Known as the E-4B, this aircraft can survive anything the enemy can throw at it, including nuclear bombs and electromagnetic pulse weapons, or EMPs. But what sort of secrets hide inside that enables this plane to survive the end of the world? First entering service in 1974, the E-4B was actually the result of a deal gone bad. Because a customer backed out of buying four Boeing 747 aircraft, the company approached the U.S. military and asked if they wanted to buy them. The military quickly snapped at the opportunity and eventually bought seven aircraft, four of which remain in service today. But why would the military want anything to do with a commercial airliner? In the event of a nuclear attack, the Soviet Union would have done exactly what the U.S. would do – cut the head off the snake before it could bite back. This proverbial head was more like the Greek goddess Medusa, with multiple heads centered around places like Washington, D.C., U.S. Strategic Command near Omaha, Nebraska, and other key installations. By taking out these sites, the Soviets hoped to sow enough confusion to prevent a U.S. counterstrike by taking out all the top decision-makers in the country. The E-4B throws a wrench in those plans by being able to ferry out the National Command Authority, which includes the President, Secretary of Defense, and their subordinates. Once airborne, the people inside can essentially fight a world war 30,000 feet in the air. How they do this will blow you away. No pun intended. While the outside of the E-4B looks eerily similar to a plane you might board for Delta or Southwest, it's inside the plane that is like stepping into a totally new world you have had the privilege of seeing until now. As you walk up to the crew door, you actually end up in the kitchen area of the plane. But don't get it twisted. Thinking there are Michelin star meals being served here, like on Air Force One, because the aircraft is primarily designed for the Secretary of Defense, the military decided to keep the original kitchen Boeing installed in its commercial aircraft. So, despite the world ending around them, military members can at least rest assured that the food on the ground will taste just as bad as in the air. But the people inside don't need fancy kitchens where they're going. They're fighting a war after all. After making a ride out of the kitchen, you'll walk into the conference room. Here, the President, Secretary of Defense, and a handful of other top leaders will make decisions about the fate of humanity, all next to a standard airplane lavatory. Moving past this room, you'll find yourself in a large conference room called the Press Room. This is where the President or his successors can brief the media about what is actually going on during a time of crisis. But Fox News and CNN probably won't be there. The 111 people that comprise the crew and support team include two teams of pilots, navigators, flight engineers, maintenance crews, a communications team, and a public affairs shop. But with just a few dozen seats in the press room, where do most of these people work? Walking through the back door of the press room, you'll find yourself in what is best described as the war room. Outfitted with the best computers 1980s money could buy, this 5,000-square-foot office space is the final bastion of democracy from which the war will be fought. With several dozen separate phone lines, satellite communications, and other necessary office equipment, this is where all the staffers will carry out orders from the National Command Authority on what to do next. After going through the war room, one will see that some of the original amenities, like the flight attendant jump seats and overhead bins, are still there. However, most of the passenger seats have been removed to make room for 14 bunk beds and a complete radio room and communication shack, meant to keep ties with the outside world. But how does this plane do this with units worldwide, including hundreds of feet below the ocean surface? Going down to the cargo bay, 
the Air Force transformed what used to be the storage for people's luggage into the key component of what makes the E-4B able to communicate with military units all over the world. While there is a ton of important equipment, like transformers and associated electrical equipment, but down there, the main piece of gear is the trailing wire antenna, or TWA. The TWA may look unassuming, but it is actually a crucial piece of equipment. Wrapped around a spool, there are around five miles of wire that an operator can pay out behind the aircraft. Once fully let out, the E-4B can then send ultra-low frequencies with wavelengths two and a half times the diameter of the Earth. With this ability, the E-4B can easily communicate with Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines to launch a counterstrike, no matter how obliterated the mainland United States is. But with this aircraft being a souped-up civilian airliner, how has the military hardened it to survive the end of the world? In a world where everything is digital, including fridges, watches, and practically everything else in our daily lives, the E-4B stands out as being stuck in the 1980s. Think of it as the last working VCR in a world full of streaming devices. But why keep it this way? You must have missed it during our tour of the plane, but the windows are what look like mesh wiring. The mesh is just one of the various countermeasures the U.S. military has installed to ensure the airplane can survive an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. During a high-altitude nuclear blast, the resulting explosion will release a ton of electromagnetic energy either through gamma rays, ionization of the atmosphere, or several other ways. These electromagnetic waves might not do much damage to human tissue, but they will wreak havoc on anything digital. This is because an EMP blast will result in huge current or voltage spikes that will overload an electrical system and basically fry it. By keeping all the equipment old school and analog, as well as other classified countermeasures like the mesh wrap, the E-4B is able to continue functioning even if the plane encounters this kind of threat. But what if the plane needed to stay up in the air? After all, if Russia was dropping nukes everywhere, all the available airfields would probably be toast too. Just like for EMPs, the Night Watch has an answer for that as well. With a standard takeoff weight of around 800,000 pounds, the E-4B has enough fuel for about 12 hours of flying. So, how does this plane get a top off at 30,000 feet in the air? Thanks to the extensive modifications by the Air Force, the E-4B can conduct what is known as aerial refueling. This incredibly dangerous operation involves coming within several dozen feet of an aerial tanker like a KC-135. This is because the tanker will deploy what is known as a drogue. If you were sitting in the back of a KC-135 looking aft, you would see that the drogue is basically like a giant shuttlecock. As the receiving plane gets closer, you notice what looks like a giant arm sticking out of the front of the E-4B. However, this giant extendable boom is how the aircraft connects to the drogue to begin receiving fuel. The tanker begins pumping once the boom is firmly seated within the drogue. While this might sound easy, keep in mind that it is going on at hundreds of miles per hour in adverse conditions and 30 feet away from another giant aircraft while Armageddon is basically happening, so it is no easy feat. But despite its ability to aerially refuel, the Night Watch cannot stay up forever. With its current outload of food and water, the E-4B can stay airborne for up to a week before it has to land somewhere to resupply. But before the E-4B lands, what would the first week of the end of the world look like? While the military plans for at least one night watch to be available at all times in case of this doomsday scenario, the aircraft is frequently used for other, more routine measures like Secretary of Defense travel or as a backup plane when the president is traveling. But let's just imagine what would happen if the E-4B was actually utilized in a doomsday scenario. How would that unfold? 
In real life, the end of the world would happen in a matter of minutes. As Washington gets confirmation that nuclear weapons are, in fact, heading toward the homeland, the counter-strike will begin. Because E-4Bs are no longer stored at Andrews Air Force Base outside of DC, the president would likely board Air Force One first and make a beeline for the interior of the US. However, because the Russians know where Strategic Command or STRATCOM is located, the on-duty crew would instantly take off with the staff of the National Airborne Operations Command and head towards somewhere they could meet the president. Depending on where the president is, they will likely pick a state that doesn't have much value to the Russians, like Iowa, to do a handoff. Once the president boards the E-4B, it becomes Air Force One, where he can direct how the military will fight back. Of course, before the handoff, the president was likely convening with his advisors on how to respond. But in the event of a general nuclear attack, the only real option is retaliation. However, where and how to strike back is still a matter of debate. The president makes the final decision on how to strike, and he must give the order to his nuclear forces with a biscuit? And before you ask, no, the president does not carry around an infamously dry Popeye's biscuit to throw at his enemies as a last resort. The biscuit actually looks almost like this note card and is an identifier the president carries at all times to authenticate a nuclear order as being valid from him. The biscuit also has a pre-selected menu of targets the president can choose from to give orders clearly and concisely. Think of it like ordering a number one at McDonald's, only the number one is probably a nuclear strike on Moscow. After consulting in the conference room, he ordered his forces to conduct the attack. As this was happening, the president stepped into the press room to address the nation, or what was left of it, on what was going on. As his words began to hit every remaining television in America, surviving firing units on land, air, and sea began the retaliatory attack. Thanks to the huge array of communication systems on board, the president can monitor strike progress moment by moment, including the exact time of impact. Once it's all said and done, the president would probably spend a few days up in the air as reports come in on what happened and what is left. It's very likely the president would not touch down until some deal has been brokered lest the enemy try and nuke the president as he touches down. Of course, one can only hope this is just speculation and would never happen in real life. But if it were, the men and women of the Night Watch stand ready 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to make it so. Bye for now.